I wanted to read a definition of synchronicity. Uh, this is a psychoanalytic concept that Carl Jung came up with. And synchronicity is the simultaneous occurrence of events which appear significantly related but have no discernible causal reaction. And today has been synchronistic. You know, I mean, what everybody has talked about is change and that that's what my talk is about, how to change. And specifically, how to change your brain. And what you have at, at your disposal is your mind to change your brain. So I've worked in mental health. I've worked in addictions. And, you know, when we talk about active mental illness and active addiction, my simplistic idea about those diseases is my brain's lying to me. So, so what I need is a mind that's going to refute that. So a lie like, well, I've been clean and sober for six months. You know, I've learned a lot. You know, I know how to handle this. I can do one time is not going to matter. And I need my mind to say, come on, you've tried that before. How well did that work last time? Or I've been up all night thinking and trying to figure out God's telling me all these plans, how to save the world. And I know I can do it. And I'm going to, my mind has to say, wait a minute, this has happened before. Remember, that's a, that's a brain disease. You have a brain disease. So how does the mind change the brain? The brain is a very complicated organ. You know, the brain is part of the central nervous system, which is comprised of the, the brain and the spinal cord, sending information, receiving information from the outside environment. The peripheral nervous system is the body and all the neural groupings in the body receiving information, sending it to the brain, receiving information from the brain really complicated. I can remember in medical school taking the course in neurology and it just is so complicated, so complex. And I can remember one shining moment studying all night for the final in neurology where it all made sense. I mean, it was beautiful. It was complex, but it was beautifully integrated. And the, the primary responsibility is to foster health and safety for the human body. You know, it's remarkable how well it works most of the time, but there are times where it doesn't. So I had uh, at ABH, the Appalachian Behavioral Health, the state hospital here in Athens, um, I had a patient who, you know, frequent flyers is the term that's used sometimes derogatorily, but he was a young man who would be hospitalized uh, in a decompensated state, stabilized, be discharged, just as rapidly stop his medication, start abusing substances, decompensate, and require rehospitalization. And I met him a number of times in this cycle until the last time he, uh, he apparently got into an altercation with a police officer, ended up breaking his jaw, and did the forensic pathway. And finally ended up at ABH as a forensic patient, not guilty by reason of insanity. They have no privileges initially until They've sort of established themselves and we can make a, you know, request to the criminal court to allow privileges. So the only privilege he had initially was locked unit to locked unit. And so I got into the habit of every Friday taking him to the hospital library, picking up some movies because it's a pretty boring stint uh, during the weekends, especially for somebody young. One Friday he asked me, I want to pick up A Beautiful Mind. And if people aren't familiar with that movie, it's the, the story of John Nash, who was a brilliant economist and mathematician who also had schizophrenia. So we got the movie. On Monday, I get back to the hospital. He says, Doc, Doc, I got to talk to you. <laughs> what's up? Yeah, what's up? You know, when you're sick, you're coughing, you're seizing, you have a headache, you don't feel good, you're aching, you can't have a fever, but you, you know you're sick. But when you're sick in your head, how do you know it? You know, and that to me was a moment of insight, that he had an idea, that he had a problem, and that he needed to fix that problem. And that's the first step towards recovery. So the brain is this complicated organ. We're talking about hundreds of billions of neurons, which are basic nerve cells that interact with 10,000 other neurons, each of which interact with 10,000 other neurons. So we're talking about hundreds of trillions of connections 
then there's an estimate that maybe what we're talking about is on-off patterns, firing patterns of 10 to the millionth power, <laughs> which is 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, a million times. So we're talking about, you know, incredible. The important part of the brain that's that I really wanted to focus on is called the prefrontal cortex. It's part of the brain right behind your forehead. And it contains what are called executive functions. It's about attention, focus, maintaining attention and focus. It's about planning and judgment. The prefrontal cortex is unique because it connects with every other part of the brain. It connects to the thalamus, which receives sensory information from the external environment what I'm seeing, tasting, touching, feeling, hearing. It also connects to all the sensory information coming from inside the body. What my stomach's doing, what my heart's doing, what my lungs are doing, what my gut's doing, what my joints are doing, what my muscles are doing. So it get, gets all that information. It's also connected to the limbic system. The prefrontal cortex have fibers going to the limbic system, which is emotions, which is sadness, happiness, joy, it's also connected to the hippocampus, which is the memory storage. So things that I've done, I can use those to make decisions. It's connected to the cerebellum, and people are familiar with the cerebellum as, you know, motor balance, physical balance. You know, it's the policeman stopping you and, and doing a sobriety test, walking a straight line is your physical balance. We also know that the cerebellum is connected to emotional balance and cognitive balance. Prefrontal cortex is also connected to the basal ganglion, which is motor activity, motor initiation. So it's connected to everything. So that's the brain, and where is the mind? And there's really no you know, agreed upon location for the mind, but, but we know that the mind, the functions of the prefrontal cortex give you the spirit the soul, the personality. That's where they, they arise from. The prefrontal cortex is also the newest evolutionarily part of the brain. So, and it's what marks the transition from being hominid, human-like, to human. So, there, so the mind, the brain. Right. So there are two researchers that I've really admired that talk about um, the prefrontal cortex and the mind. And one of them is Jeffrey Schwartz, who's, both of them are from UCLA, the Mindfulness Awareness Clinic in, at UCLA. And Jeffrey Schwartz was really interested in OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And most people know what that is. I have this intrusive thought that tells me I gotta do something. I feel anxious about it until I do it. The interesting thing about OCD is that mostly it's, I know that that's not true, I know that you know I haven't touched anything that's dirty, or I know I just pulled the plug out of the coffee pot. I don't have to go, but I have to go do it because there's so much emotion attached to that idea that I have to do the behavior, and then the, the anxiety diminishes. So Jeffrey Schwartz did a study with individuals with OCD, and he used, he developed this technique that's based on CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. And he taught them to pay attention, to be mindful, because he also had a background in mindfulness meditation, to be mindful, to pay attention to what you're thinking. That when you have an obsessive thought, to identify it. This is a symptom of this disorder. What is it? I have this disorder called OCD. But I can do something else. I can do other coping skills that I've identified. I can do something that feels good. I can go work in the garden. I can go crochet. I can go color, I can go for a run, and to postpone doing the compulsive behavior. So he wanted to test out how this worked. He, he asked people to really pay attention to their thoughts and practice this identification, attach it to this disorder, but I don't have to do the behavior, I can do something else. Appreciating that sometimes the, that the compulsive behavior is so intense that I have to do it, but then the next time, identification, clarification. So he had people practice this and make a commitment to doing this. And 10 weeks, so he did a PET scan before and a PET scan afterwards. And PET scan is a positron 
emission tomography, and it's using labeled oxygen and x-raying where is the oxygen going. And we know that the more oxygen used indicates more work being done. So he did PET scans before they started the treatment, and then 10 weeks later, initially the PET scans were this bright red loop from the prefrontal cortex to the amygdala, which is in the limbic system, which is the seat of anxiety, to the basal ganglion, which is motor initiation. So from the thought to anxiety, do I got to do it? After 10 weeks of practicing delay, that PET scan showed significant decrease in the hypermetabolic pathway. So we're talking about changing the way the brain works by thinking about it. I mean, which to me is just an amazing concept. One of his uh, co-workers at UCLA Mindful Awareness Clinic was a, a gentleman named Daniel Siegel, who wanted to see, okay, what does meditation do? Um, so he enlisted a group of volunteers to just practice meditation, and he put them in an MRI scanner before, and then after 16 weeks of practicing this meditation, MRI scanner again. And so what he wanted them to do was to commit to 15 minutes a day, practicing mindfulness meditation, specifically breath-focused. So sitting quietly, watching your breath, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, knowing that sometimes thoughts intrude, but to dismiss those, refocus on breathing in and out. After 16 weeks of doing this, no medication, nothing else, the, the size of the middle prefrontal cortex increased just by doing mindful meditation. And that blows my mind. You know, that I can, just by thinking, change how my brain works, and I can change how capable it is because I'm increasing the mass, increasing the effort. So what does, so the specific area that Daniel Siegel noted increased in size is what's called the middle orbital frontal uh, cortex, or the, the prefrontal cortex. And it's right between um, your eyes, and that, area of the brain is responsible for diminished fear. It's responsible for attunement, the ability to connect with another person. And most of you will know that when you look in somebody's eyes, there's an amazing difference than if you're just talking to them, looking to the side. All right. It's connecting to another individual. It's appreciating that you are somebody, and I know you're somebody, and you know me, and you know that I'm somebody, and I know that you know that I'm somebody, and it's really the connections. It's about pausing prior to acting. That's what an increase in the prefrontal, middle prefrontal cortex does. It gives you time to think, I was gonna go do this. Well, no, wait a minute, that might not be the best thing. I work at Bassett House, and one of the things that I think is so important teaching the kids at Bassett House is play the tape out, all right? You're in a situation, you have to make a decision. Okay, okay, then what? Ugh, well, that's not so good. So with this, okay, well, that's a little bit better. Well, how about this? Ah, oh, yeah, this is what I have to do. Instead of just having an idea and doing it. You know, it's impulse control. Um, it's also, uh, the middle prefrontal cortex is also associated with morality. It's the moral code. What I'm allowed to do, not because there's a rule that I can't do this and can't do that, but because I can't do that. So practicing increases the prefrontal cortex and the ability to connect. And so when we talk about mental illness, serious mental illness, when we talk about drug addiction, we talk about individuals that get very, very isolated, you know. And what has been talked about earlier is community. So that if I'm increasing my ability to, to, to connect with other people, I'm going to have an easier time connecting to a community. Um, I'm also going to have an easier time working with a sponsor, working with a counselor, working with a peer recovery specialist, working with a doctor who can then help me to strengthen my mind so that I can help my brain. To me, this is just, a, just amazing, amazing work that's done. And 
you know, I don't have to wait to have a serious psychiatric illness. I don't have to wait to have a, a serious substance abuse issue. We all have problems. We all have difficulties in our life that we can change, that we can react to differently. One of my favorite slogans is half empty or half full. You know, that I know if I look at a glass of water half filled, that if I look at as half empty, that's going to impact how I feel, how I think, and what I do. And it's going to get me thinking of, how come I only get half a glass of water? I bet everybody else has a lot more water than that. This isn't fair. Or I can see it as, oh, it's half full. Boy, I was thirsty. That's going to really help. And that's going to affect how I think, how I feel, and what I do. And we're free to make those choices. You know, we're free. But I can only change me. I have to decide what needs to change. I have to decide what is it about me that doesn't feel good about me. What, what, how do I see myself different? How can I be different? And to work to that. And, and that's possible. Change is possible. One of the, uh, I have a, a whole list of, of wisdom prayers, wisdom sayings. And one of the, the favorites recently is um, I have to watch my thoughts. They become my words. I have to watch my words, they become my actions. I have to watch my actions, they become my habits. I have to watch my habits, that becomes my character. I have to watch my character because that becomes my destiny. You know, I'm in control of that. Nobody else can do that for me. I have to do it myself, but I have to do it. You know, we all have the potential to get better, to recover, you know, change nasty little habits, to change things that make us feel bad about ourselves so that we feel better. You know, and we can do that, and we can use our mind to do that, to change our brain. And, you know, the change is possible. The change does happen, and change makes you feel better. And I think that's it.